and I've been working on a T-Rex skull for like five years at a natural history museum, just as kind of an introductory thing. So CAD generally is taking an idea and so that you can actually put it into the real world. 3D scanning's the opposite of that, of taking something in the real world to use digitally. And I primarily, primarily use photogrammetry, which is using cameras to take pictures of objects and combining that to generate a 3D object from those photos. And that's what I'll be uh, demoing in a little bit. So with CAD, and especially having the calipers, it's great because I found these stage lights on the side of the road and I just had it in my lap with calipers and was literally able to remake it. And then I had to work with a uh, grad student from Northwestern on a project. And just from photographs, I was able to take an MRI machine and create recreate it in 3D. So CAD can do a lot of things, but all of this is very mechanical. It's all straight edges or circles, but 3D scanning really is good for organic shapes. And LiDAR is one of the ways that you can 3D scan stuff. And this will create basically a gigantic point cloud. And from those points, each point has its own reference data. So the data sets on this is gonna be huge, but it's really good for environmental scans, um, buildings, doing real estate, uh, pretty much anything real world to get a uh, digital data set of it. And then also you can then do multiple years of data sets. So you can actually see changes over time too. And this is one of those kind of uh, types of 3D scanners. It's a Matterport. And that creates these huge dense uh, mesh clouds that you can then turn into 3D uh, meshes. This I actually used uh, to do real estate virtual tours. So we would take it and basically place it around a building in each room in each corner to create a um, virtual reality tour for that building. But for 3D printing, it's not terribly great. It's meant for large spaces. And so they also used it with the uh, Cathedral Notre Dame in Paris, where they um, 3D scanned it. I believe it was for Assassin's Creed, but then when it burned down, they had a really recent scan of it. So they're able to use that to recreate any of the damage done and have it be exactly how uh, it had originally been. And another way of 3D scanning are these sense scanners. I've used uh, the next one I'm gonna show, but these are handheld scanners that are able to basically go around an object. And what's really great is you can actually see the object forming in real time. So this is the one that um, attaches to an iPad. And as you can see right here, you're actually seeing the mesh being generated in real time. It's not a post-production process. So you have a really good sense of, <laughs> with the sense scanners, of what is what you're actually gonna get from the object. And these are really great for doing people, um, pets. I've seen all sorts of stuff done with these. I actually had a student that was had a fog machine and he was able to actually uh, 3D scan the fog, which was really interesting. And this is the only one that I haven't had any real experience with, which is using um, a turntable with um, either a Kinect or a actual dedicated um, camera and lasers. But this lets you do small objects, you know, like um, a lot of people use these with uh, tabletop board games where they buy the piece and then they can make duplicates of it because it does do a very high detail, but it's really limited in the size of it. And then with photogrammetry, this is on um, the 3D scan of the Titanic. So in water, you can't use lasers because it just diffuses in the water. So this was taken from the video feed of the drones being sent down and they were able to stitch all the video together and actually recreate the uh, Titanic. And they've done it a bunch of times to see how fast it's degrading down at the bottom of the ocean and there various changes from year to year. I tried it out because um, I was able to download on YouTube a documentary of video footage and I was able to get the bow done. But since it wasn't a continuous uh, video feed, it was just, you know, clips of it, I was only able to get small sections of it. But it's kind of fun to try out. So with photogrammetry, this is the one I'm going to be really covering. You want to go essentially from low to high, but going around in circles. So that basically gives you loops of uh, camera footage around the object in various um, angles. So your file will end up kind of looking like this, where you go around in circles at a high view, you know, waist height, and then a lower view. And this all generates 
those point clouds to generate a uh, 3D mesh. So now I'm gonna go through some of the ones that I've done. So I started out in college using an actual handheld projector, basically projecting patterns and taking a photo for each pattern on an object to create a uh, mesh cloud. And this is the basically the first uh, 3D scans I ever did of uh, classmates. So it's really pretty rough. Um, the there's some detail there, but it's not great. Um, but these are the point clouds that were generated from uh, my classmates. And then I kind of went back and redid this one. So I took a trip up the seacoast going up Route 1A and basically stopped at every single beach to try and find pieces of driftwood and was 3D scanning those to basically create uh, speaker forms um, that would, would be uh, translucent. And now pretty much every time I go on a hike, if I see a really interesting piece of wood or an object, I'll do a quick 3D scan with my phone because you can use the camera from your phone too to do these kind of scans. So it's really pretty flexible. And for my internship in uh, college, I worked for a headphone company and you know, just also uh, reiterate doing ideation where you really wanna not just go set on one idea, you wanna just see where those ideas lead. And so a big part of it was doing in-ear headphones around specific drivers. But so how do you get that data, how it's gonna fit? Um, we had to do a ton of molds of inner ears. Um, it's really not comfortable to have a uh, two-part um, rubber poured into your ear. But we also had some anatomical models but those are very expensive and we'd have to send it back. So my boss had me 3D scan the ear mold to, so that we had the data that we could actually A, use in CAD to see fittings and um, how everything works, but also we could then 3D print our spares and uh, try those out too. And then I worked for a 3D printing uh, ceramic firm and using 3D scanning, I was able to come up with a piece of toast as a co uh, toaster. And then also um, I did a Zeus scan, you know, just trying stuff out and turned it into a ceramic planter. But with these, um, this was actually a uh, single photo of a piece of toast. So it's a little different where using one photo, you can actually create a height bite, uh, bump map and get all the detail and then turn it into a 3D form. And Rhino is really good at doing that. So I was also a, a research assistant for Christoph Wodichko at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And he does a lot of projection mapping where you do uh, projections on 3D forms. And he works a lot with veterans with PTSD and the homeless and pretty much giving them a voice in the public space. So this was a project where we were, we were recording students at the Graduate School of Design and them talking about uh, mental health issues. And to do that, there's you know, three different projectors to get all the different uh, coverage on a uh, person and then so for each projector, you needed a specific camera to match that angle. And we were doing it on the John Harvard uh, statue in the Harvard Square. And so to basically help out with the projection mapping, I did a 3D scan of the John Harvard statue where the projection would be. And then these are the students being projected onto the statue. And then for uh, another coworker at the Graduate School of Design, he uh, does a lot of work with Superfund sites. And so he was working on a project around the Pilgrim uh, nuclear plant, and which is right close to Plymouth Rock and also Pilgrim Plymouth, that whole kind of connection going on. So I did a 3D scan for him of the actual Plymouth Rock because he was gonna take it and basically turn it into a um, Geiger counter to keep track of uh, the nuclear discharges from the plant. And you know, doing research for him, you know, we were going to be basically use a Raspberry Pi and there's a Geiger counter uh, hat board for it. And it would basically either record the readings or also we were thinking of having it um, light up with different indications of uh, radiation levels. But then using the form of Plymouth Rock to basically house all of those components. And then while I was working at Harvard, I was also running the uh, advanced production lab at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, which is this lab right here. So we had you know, a bunch of 3D printers, the cubes, which I will never ever use again, the Form 1 and a laser cutter. And we also had one of those Sense uh, 3D scanners that I showed earlier. So coming up with examples around the area of what the students could do with it, because it was really great, again, just being able to see what is happening with the scan in real time as a beginning starting point. 
And then before COVID, I was uh, instructing intro to video at, uh, back at NASART where I went to college. And so this was basically the materials the students were using. And while I was there, I was using the camera as since there's a student cage where all students um, in the freshman year have access to this particular camera. So I used that as a way to try out 3D scanning with only this camera to see what I could come up with around uh, the campus. And didn't come, turn out too shabby. So this was the courtyard and was able to get all that data. The student dorms, I had to go to the top of the uh, library and shoot down onto it to get the top angles and everything. Um, and then from the courtyard, I was able to actually take out sections of it. And so I really only wanted the um, bust of the uh, bearded man right here. And then from there, I was able to 3D print it out and started trying out some projection mappings and stuff I learned back at Harvard, um, just to try, you know, experiment and try things out. Then on my own, I like to go to museums and 3D scan fossils. Like I said, this T-Rex skull took me five years of tries to try and get it right. But I finally got all the teeth, all the detail that I finally wanted. And then other fossils, you know, Triceratops skull that I was going to turn into a uh, coat hanger, um, a T-Rex footprint, uh, which uh, fossils of fish, more dinosaur footprints, this amphibian skull. Because I also really want to go back and uh, I, I never know how to say it, the Dunkleopteryx, the really big uh, fish with the giant armored skull. I want to try and 3D scan that next. Hey, Tom. Yeah. When you when you say it took you five years to to get that scan, um, what did you have to do differently to make it work versus the times that uh, that it didn't? So the software I'm going to be introducing in a little bit, you're limited to only a hundred photos, and I needed way more photos. I that T Rex skull I believe was around five thousand photos finally when all was said and done. And also, the the software I'm going to be showing is cloud based. I needed to have a computer that could handle it without the cloud. So this is another one. This is Madame Sherry's Palace. It's a building that burned down back in the 30s in a state reservation. Um, and I wanted to see if I could get all the basement and basically have everything be one continuous uh, scan and got it really pretty good. I've been able to do uh, animations of actually a drone flying through the basement up and out to show the uh, whole layout of everything. And then for a friend, we were, this was nothing major. We were just kind of coming up with ideas <coughs> of what to do with 3D scanning. And we were looking into stress fractures and having a more mobile uh, cast around it. So I did a quick 3D scan of my friend's arm. And that is one thing you're gonna have to think about if you are doing anatomical things, you need the person to be pretty still, which gets a little tricky, especially if say you're, uh, trying to scan someone's arm because of a disability, you might need to think of how to have them so they can actually hold their arm in a certain position for at least 15, 20 minutes, which can be a little tricky. So again, the, with the software I'm gonna be showing you, it's uh, Autodesk Recap. You should be able to get it for free um, as a student and you are limited again to the 100 photo max. But just as an introductory way of 3D scanning, this will be pretty easy uh, to learn because again, it's cloud-based. So you don't have to have you know, 128 gigs of RAM, a 3090 and a 24 core processor to get it done. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is you don't want any blurry photos. So when you're uploading everything, make sure you go through it, every single photo and, pull, and delete any that are blurry. And you also want to use the same lens and zoom length. You want everything to be consistent through it all. So normally when I'm shooting, I'm using a DSLR and I'll use a prime lens. So I don't have to worry about zoom creep or anything. And you also wanna make sure since you are uh, limited to a hundred photos, you wanna make sure that they're original quality, no compression, no reducing of the uh, file size. Cause since it's the cloud, it's on Autodesk to process it. You don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, do you have any tips for like keeping the camera the same distance from like the object? So that actually doesn't really matter, but you do want to make sure your object is in frame and not uh, zoomed in so that it's too close. So it's more just, you know, keeping the object square. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is Autodesk Recap. It's pretty easy to use and a little basic, but again, for a very intro uh, 
introductory way of doing it, it's pretty easy. So let's see there. So this is that ear mold that I had done. Where you get all the details. And again, so a lot of times you uh, think there's detail, but there's not because of the texture map. So you also wanna make sure you check it in a shaded view, because this will show you everything that's actually going on. And as you can see, these meshes are really dense. So to do this, um, you go to object and it, it'll also do drone video, but I don't have a drone yet. So I haven't tried that part out yet. And I think that you're limited to 250 photos. But to start, you go to object. And then you load up. So I'm going to redo the Zeus scan. And you don't also have to have 100 photos. You can have less. But since you are limited to that 100 photo limit, you do really want to try and have as many as possible. So as you can see, I basically went around the Zeus head in different angles and at different heights. So you load it all up and then hit create. Let's name it and click start. And so now it's already actually already processed. And it crashed. But since it's, uh, what should we call it, on the cloud, even though it just crashed, it's still going on in the background. It's not on the laptop. So since I already have that one done, So when you also 3D scan, a lot of your background will uh, get incorporated into the scan because you know I was trying to get gather as much data as possible and you're not in the back. So you will generate some extra data, but the detail you can get is really, really good. So see, got all the different curls of the hair, the nose, but you can also edit in this program, which is really handy. So I just want the Zeus head. And now I just have the Zeus head. And so if I want to 3D print this, I also need to make sure it's totally closed. So don't need that. So right now there's a hole in the bottom and you also wanna make sure there's no holes anywhere else. So in this program, you can actually edit really easily. So this hole right here, click on the edge and I want it flat. So now it is watertight. So now I would actually be able to 3D print this. Any questions so far? When you batch it, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, is it like a complete filled solid or it's all surfaces and hollow from inside? It's technically hollow inside, but the printer or CAD work will actually treat it as a solid as long as it's watertight. If there's any gaps or holes or uh, broken seams, it will be treated as a solid. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Long, oh, sorry. How long do like the 100 photo renders take? The renders or the processing? Or the processing, yeah. Uh, depends. Uh, say there's a lot of. Uh, 
thing, things going on in your background, that'll definitely limit the time. But I've never had one go for more than an hour doing this. Okay. Whereas with my old computer doing 3D scans manually through the actual hardware that I had, I had some run for over a week straight, just processing away. But, you know, that was also over 7,000 photos for a haunted uh, train tunnel that's abandoned. That's like a quarter mile long. It's kind of interesting that you talk about this because um, I... I 3D printed like a, a little thing that rotates when you turn it and it's for 3D scanning. And oh, it, has nice. a, it has a place to like put your phone and then you rotate the object, the platform, and it'll rotate the object around so you can get like a, a view of it. Oh, that's cool. What were you going to be 3D scanning? Um, Just like many action figures and stuff here and there for my little brother or like board games or something like that. Gotcha. Yeah, Hasbro is now actually doing something where you can have your own head 3D printed on a toy. Oh, wow, that's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. Any advice on avoiding background? It, so if you're 3D scanning something in the real world, it's a little tricky because you don't have too much control over that. But I would definitely set up a spot, almost like a photo studio, and actually have you know, white backgrounds and really be able to isolate the object you're 3D scanning. So like here, you know, it's on a wall in a museum. I have no options other than trying to get it. And this was the T-Rex footprint. But you can also use this process to also generate virtual spaces too. I don't know if you were at the orientation for Beaverworks, but uh, one of the professors did this to, to create a drone, drone space. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I also use it to um, 3D scan molds. So I took a lot of my old 90s creepy crawlers and I actually now have the scorpion and the earthworm and everything. And I can basically flip them back and forth doing um, either a positive or a negative. Let's see here. And like this one was only, I think like 30 photos but I was still able to get a lot of detail on the actual skull done. What happens to the back of that? I'd have to fill it in very badly. <laughs> Cause again, this was in a display case. I can't yeah. you know, open up the case, go photographing behind it and <laughs> see how it goes. And are you filling that in using recap or are you filling that in with something else? I generally use recap to do the majority of it. But like something like this, where there's a really going to be a really fine mesh, I'll actually delete meshes in Rhino. Mm, okay, yeah. Yeah, like trying to separate this type of mesh is really pretty tricky. And so other than 3D scanning or uh, 3D printing your 3D scans, you can also use um, 123D Make to actually generate flat patterns to then do a um, model of it out of uh, you know, wood, paper, cardboard. So with this, your CAD file has to be an STL or an OBJ, which are mesh files. And in this, dimensions are really important. You're gonna need to know what the material you're using and what the actual scale of your original object is. So here is an arm scan. I, and again, so your dimensions. So it was 24 long. And say I want to laser cut it out of Plexi. I would need my material to be at least as big as the arm itself. So length, I'm going to go 30 with generally 24. And it's, th and it's thickness. This is where you either need to know it ahead of time, or you can use your calipers and then measure it. So, Yeah, 
And so now it's all individual sections. Let's say I want it actually stacked the other way. So now I can get much more fidelity in it by actually having it stacked and it'll generate these patterns for you. And numbering is also really important because with all these different pieces, knowing what's what can get a little tricky. But you can actually see the assembly steps. And this is where your numbering really comes in handy. couple other ways of actually slicing it up. So see, starting to get an actual form here from the 3D scan. And using that, I was doing all sorts of weird lighting with it, taking uh, CAD data, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek to make lights. And then I made a enterprise light. So this is a really interesting way of taking a 3D form and a 2D manufacturing process to make a 3D form. And as an optional assignment, if you guys want to try it out, um, I can. I have a resin printer behind me that I can actually do most 3D scans with. And so if you have come up with a model, I'll 3D print it. 